Good morning. My name is Rachel McCaskill. My name is Pablo Hernandez Basulto. And my name is Yael Urbach. And the three of us recently played major roles in the theater department's production of Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. So one of the roles that I played um, in this production was that of choreographer. Um, and that started by talking to the director to figure out what we wanted the dance to look like on stage. Um, what lady we knew is that? that we wanted it to be synchronized. We're still in the hand of young actors in the world of this play. Um, oh, she knew this dance, to do right. this dance in this music for any ball or master that we can go to. Uh, she so hangs the one and she can play the little rich And then Ethiop's ear. We also knew that we wanted a lot of beauty. Too um, rich because for during this particular dance, or Earth, too dear. Romeo has his monologue about his son Juliet for the first time, and he wanted him to only catch fleeting glimpses of her throughout. Did my heart um, love till now? Now, as far as the music for choice is concerned, I wasn't able to choreograph a traditional waltz to it, so what we ended up doing was taking a Latin dance and adding waltz configuration and styling to it, so it was still fun and upbeat, but still had that seamless elegance to it. I did the mask design for Romeo and Juliet. The masks play a very interesting role in this play. They are what allow uh, Romeo to crash into the Capulet's party and meet Juliet. I think uh, masks, instead of hiding us, they give us this um, permission to be who we truly are. Um, I was responsible for the making of 12 masks and renovation of three masks that the, par the department already had. Uh, costume designer Francis Nelson McSherry gave me two very clear instructions. They should be animal masks and they should be abstract. So I started with research. I started looking at every character in that scene and thinking which animal would represent better who they were and what they wanted in that specific scene. Then I started doing drawings about each, how I wanted each mask to look like, thinking about geometrical shapes I found in each animal's faces. After that, I, we bought basic masks and I covered them with newspaper and cardboard to get the shapes I wanted. And then we covered them with sculpture coat and yeso to make them stronger. And finally, we painted them to match the colors of the robes they were, the characters were wearing. I also um, was part of this process because I wanted to explore the possibilities of interdisciplinary interaction between theater and other disciplines. And I thought 3D printing would be a very exciting possibility. So um, I made the feathers of the peacock mask on a 3D modeling program called Maya. And then we 3D printed them, first in the Form 1 printer, but that didn't work out. And then we tried the MakerBot, and that really got the shape we wanted. Um, I think this is just the beginning of the, the possibilities of making something that is not just something you print and there it is, but that it can come to action in a stage. It was a very challenging but interesting process, and I definitely couldn't have done it without the help of everyone at the costume shop. Um, but it was very satisfying to see something that was in my head come to live on stage. I worked on the sound design for Romeo and Juliet. Um, so <laughs> Present. Uh, and so part of what I did as sound designer was to find ways to bring uh, those two worlds together. Um, so one of my first uh, things that I looked into was finding other music beyond just that that sort of fit into this world of strings but also felt about this is that it managed to keep the tone for the tomb scene without getting sentimental or sappy, uh, which was something that was very important to both me and the director. Uh, one of the next things I did was to take some of this music and really build it into layers so that it would fit into the world. So this is actually a piece that we used for the balcony scene, which is 
takes a bit of the music that's actually from the same piece that was used in the tune, so you get that connection between the beginning of their love and the tragic end, and it's uh, layered in with night noises to really set it in Verona and let that color the whole scene. So another role that I had on this project was that of dramaturg. As the dramaturg, I did historical and background research, um, both on the time period that William Shakespeare is writing, so Elizabeth in uh, England, and also when the play took place. Um, and I made those materials accessible to both the cast and the director and audiences. Um, and I did that by distributing materials to the cast, um, by sitting in on almost all of the rehearsals, and then by creating a lobby display um, outside of the theater writing an article for the back of the playbill, and then leading a post-show discussion after one of the uh, performances. Uh, some of my research also involved compiling images. Uh, these are two of my favorite images. The one on the left is a 1976 production of Romeo and Juliet done by the Royal Shakespeare Company. We see a 36-year-old Ian McKellen there as Romeo. Um, the image on the right is a Waterhouse painting done in 1898, um, and it's titled Juliet. And what I really loved about this piece is not only did it look like our Juliet, um, but the, the brush strokes give it this expressionistic malleability um, that really leave it up to interpretation. So something that the three of us discovered by working on this piece is that interesting performance arts pieces are created when you have people that come from a multitude of backgrounds and disciplines. And when we collaborate on these pieces, we create theater that is not only compelling and dynamic, but is also interesting and thereby relevant to a wide variety of groups and audiences. Thank you. Um, as a coincidence, today is World Theatre Day, which is a celebration of theatre that happens all across the world. <laughs> so I'm going to ask the students to read with me this um, message from South African playwright and activist Brett Bailey. So how about if I take the first paragraph and then you can swap it off. Wherever there is human society, the irrepressible spirit of performance manifests under trees in tiny villages and on high-tech stages in global metropolis, in school halls and in fields and in temples, in slums, in urban plazas, community centers and inner city basements, people are drawn together to commune with the ephemeral theatrical worlds that we create to express our human complexity, our diversity, our vulnerability in living flesh and breath and voice. We gather to weep and remember, to laugh and to contemplate, to learn and to affirm and to imagine, to wonder at technical dexterity and to incarnate gods, to catch our collective breath at our capaci capacity for beauty and compassion and monstrosity. We come to be energized and to be empowered, to celebrate the wealth of our various cultures and to dissolve the boundaries that divide us. Wherever there is human society, the irrepressible spirit of performance manifests. Born of community, it wears the masks and the costumes of our varied traditions, and harnesses our languages and rhythms and gestures, and clears a space in our midst. And we, the artists that work with this ancient spirit, feel compelled to channel it through our hearts, our ideas, and our bodies to reveal our realities in their mundan mundanity and glittering mystery. But in this era, in which so many millions are struggling to survive, are suffering under oppressive regimes and predatory capitalism, are fleeing conflict and hardship, in which our privacy is invaded by secret services and our words are censored by intrusive governments, in which forests are being annihilated, species exterminated, and oceans poisoned. What do we feel compelled to reveal? In this world of unequal power, in which various hegemonic orders try to convince us that one nation, one race, one gender, one sexual preference, one religion, one ideology, one cultural framework is superior to all others, is it really defensible to insist that the arts should be unshackled from social agendas? Are we, the artists of arenas and stages, conforming to the sanitized demands of the market or seizing the power that we have? 
to a, clear a space in our hearts and minds of society, to gather people around us, to inspire, enchant, and inform, and to create a world of hope and open-hearted collaboration. That's it, right? Yeah, that's well, it. Thank you. Thank you.